You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 27, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, atypical infections and asthma. Our presenter is Dr. Prescott Atkinson. He's a professor and director of pediatric allergy and immunology at the University of Alabama in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, so welcome back everyone to COLA, our second um, presentation today. Um, we'd like to welcome Dr. Atkinson, um, who is a professor and director of pediatric allergy and immunology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And today we'll be presenting on atypical infections and asthma. Thanks again, Dr. Atkinson. The time's all yours. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Jordan. And um, I have to apologize out front. I've got a little bit of laryngitis today, so I'm going to be <clears throat> kind of clearing my throat a little bit. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'll try to try to do it as little as possible. Um, yeah, so um, I'm going to talk today about uh, one of my favorite uh, subjects. I got interested in uh, mycoplasma pneumonia uh, over 10 years ago, well, over 20 years ago now. <clears throat> now, UAB is a, uh, is a big reference center, and they have a pretty worldwide famous uh, mycoplasma lab here, so it's been a great collaboration over those times. And not only mycoplasma pneumonia and asthma, which is a, sort of an ongoing story, and certainly a, I think a, I'll show you as a, a contributor to, uh, to the severity and possibly to the pathogenesis in, in a subset of patients with asthma, uh, but also uh, these organisms are frequently opportunistic pathogens in patients with uh, immune deficiencies. Uh, and, and sometimes in normal, uh, apparently normal hosts as well. So they're quite an interesting group. I'll just, I'm going to give a little bit of a, <clears throat> an overview. Um, let's see if I can figure out how to change my slides. I, I don't have any relevant disclosures uh, for, this, for this talk. Um, and uh, I'm first going to review a little bit about the sort of ongoing story in, um, in the role of the airway microbiome um, in asthma particularly. And um, talk a little bit about uh, infections, uh, different types of, uh, of infections with a focus today on mycoplasma pneumonia. Atypical uh, pneumonias basically are uh, uh, the bulk of which are caused by my mycoplasma pneumonia, at least in North America. And I'm going to go over the biology of the organism a little bit, <clears throat> and then problems in diagnosis and treatment, um, and a problem that's occurring worldwide with macrolide resistance. Uh, with this organism that it's, it's well to keep in mind if you have a patient that's, uh, that's got an infection. <clears throat> so um, it wasn't so very long ago, uh, 1997, when this statement was published, uh, which is still, uh, you know, fascinating to look back and, and see how our perspective has changed um, in health. Bacteria colonize the upper respiratory tract, but the lower respiratory tract keeps the lungs sterile from the first bronchial division down. So. That was, the, that was the view uh, from, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, very respectable pulmonologists and, and uh, other lung physiologists and, and so forth as late as 1997, but it wasn't very much longer until the view had completely changed. And we now realize that there is a distinct microbiome. The organisms are frequently present in rel relatively low abundance, sometimes not so much, though, particularly in inflammatory lung diseases like COPD and asthma. Um, and uh, we see a, 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 a distortion of the normal uh, microbiome uh, that is still being, um, <clears throat> we're still trying to understand uh, what this means. This is sort of a chicken and the egg uh, problem with this, with this microbiome because, of course, patients with inflammatory lung diseases are always on lots of medications, frequently on antibiotics. So, you know, what is, what is uh, innate to this or inherent in this, in this distortion? And what is potentially something that's uh, that's related to their to their treatment is still something we're still trying to figure out. Um, around 2010, Hilti and her colleagues um, published a paper that that was one of the first uh, papers to show that there was a distinctive difference in the in the microbiome, and they did this with kind of brute force uh, um, 16S uh, PCR and, and clone and sequencing clones. Um, and showed that um, if you look at the outer two rings, which are asthma and COPD, 
um, you can see that the red rings on the right uh, are much, much more, uh, uh, have a higher prevalence. And these organisms are, are uh, gram negatives that frequently include pathogenic bacteria, the proteobacteria, they include organisms like Haemophilus and Neisseria, uh, and things like that. And then um, in, the, in, the, in the purple, uh, these were, were uh, more prevalent, the bacteroid, bacteroidetes, um, which are another group of, uh, of organisms that uh, are, uh, are, are gram-negative rods uh, that, are, that are sort of stable uh, parts of the, uh, of the microbiome uh, in a lot of uh, places. Those seem to be more abundant, so there seems to be a displacement um, in, the, in the patients with, um, with these inflammatory lung diseases by these uh, more pathogenic gram-negatives. And um, although it's not really parallel, similar differences have been, I mean, it's not completely parallel, but in, in, <clears throat> in studies that are ongoing in the GI tract, it's also been shown that there are differences um, in patients with asthma um, and normal healthy controls or patients with milder asthma. Um, again, the bacteroid, the bacteroid ETs um, <clears throat> uh, seem to be prevalent in, uh, in people who are, are not as sick, who don't have really severe asthma. So there, that, that theme is kind of continuing. And gram positives, a lot of the gram positives tend to be um, uh, uh, in higher abundance in people who are not as sick. Um, um, so there's a, there is, a, uh, uh, again, an influence of, apparently an influence of the gut microbiome uh, on the airway microbiome, um, since they are pretty closely connected anatomically. Um, <clears throat> so in, in, sum, in the summary of uh, microbial risk factors that was published recently, um, uh, again, the, uh, the gram negatives, um, Haemophilus neisseria maricella, tend to be more associated with asthma, um, streptococcus, uh, streptomony, and uh, other streptococci um, very early on are associated with an increase, uh, are associated with the development of subsequent asthma in children. And then there are protective effects of certain uh, genera of bacteria in the GI tract. Uh, and one organism uh, has been noted to be associated with an, with an increase in asthma in, in adults. So we're still trying to figure out um, you know, the meaning of all these differences, but there are clues to um, not only to the pathogenesis of, of asthma, but possibly also to treatment uh, eventually, <clears throat> if, we can, if we can figure out uh, exactly how this is working. Really fascinating paper that just uh, <clears throat> has just come out uh, in Jackie, uh, explores the uh, airway virome, um, which I hadn't seen much on this before. And this is certainly the most comprehensive um, uh, paper, which is uh, really shows uh, a really uh, amazing difference in patients with severe asthma uh, in uh, virus in the prevalence of certain viruses, particularly pathogenic um, uh, herpes viruses, and at the same time a concomitant decrease in phage uh, in the prevalence of phages, which uh, bacteriophage are uh, are um, uh, are, uh, of course, uh, viruses that can kill bacteria. So these may be regulatory. These may be performing a, an important role, and they're going down re in a relative fashion anyway in the, air, in the uh, airways of patients with asthma uh, in a way that sort of correlates with uh, severity. There's a, uh, a story that's uh, going to be evolving, I'm sure, and uh, it looks like it's likely to have uh, some really interesting um, uh, uh, we're going to learn some really interesting things here in the, in the coming years about this. So, um, in summary, there is a normal airway flora that, uh, in, instead of being uh, sterile, uh, there is a dominance of members of, the, of this uh, Bacteroidetes group, um, and uh, this uh, normal flora appears to be deranged in other inflammatory, uh, in, in inflammatory diseases of the lung. Um, and also these differences extend uh, to the gut as well. Uh, there's higher bacterial diversity um, as, well, uh, as well as higher bacterial numbers in patients with asthma and COPD in the airways. Uh, this new data that I just mentioned seems to show that there are uh, higher uh, numbers and diversity of uh, viruses, particularly pathogenic uh, herpes viruses in asthmatic airways, uh, and lower numbers of phages. And um, 
there's a correlation of microbial diversity and uh, burden um, with airway hyperresponsiveness and response to antibiotics that has been that has been noted in other studies. So why is this? Why do asthmatics seem to have this different airway? As I mentioned, it's kind of a chicken or the egg uh, problem. Um, so some studies have started out um, really early in life, trying to trying to see when this difference begins to occur. Um, there's a thought that maybe there's, uh, um, and, and it's likely that there's partly an inherent or genetic uh, influence and partly an acquired difference due to exposure uh, in the environment to allergens and, and also to micro, microorganisms that's influencing, influencing uh, the airway immune responses. Uh, this is from a, a very recent uh, uh, review by Deckers and Panamutius. Um, and, uh, complicated slide, lots of un uncertainties here, but indicating that um, farm dust, this is the so-called farm effect uh, that uh, her group has been so prominent in, uh, in uh, exploring, that early exposure to farm dust and endotoxin in the farm environment is protective in, against the development of asthma, and it appears to be through, partly through the, uh, the, the influence of, of these uh, mediators on uh, toll-like receptors, particularly TLR4, and, um, and also the development of regulatory T cells that oppose uh, the development and, and anti-inflammatory cytokines like IL-10 that oppose the development of Th2 skewing uh, in the airway. As I mentioned, uh, some groups have, uh, have, uh, um, have gone to some lengths to look early in, um, uh, in uh, uh, in infancy to see when the development of airway hyperresponsiveness develops uh, as well as, uh, as we'll get to in a minute, um, um, uh, exposure to our, 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 uh, uh, the, the differences in the microbiome. And uh, this, is, this is, to me, still just an amazing paper. Um, this is from Hans Biscard's group in Copenhagen. Uh, they had um, 363 infants uh, that they measured, actually did uh, methicoline, um, uh, measured uh, lung responses to methicoline at one month of age, and then followed the children out for, I think, three years, um, uh, two years of age, and um, 34 of the infants uh, had severe bronchiolitis before two years of age. Um, and um, what they observed was that the patients that, uh, that had the severe bronchiolitis uh, fell into a group that, was, that had lower PD-15 um, uh, numbers uh, than, the, than the, uh, the group that had, um, than the other uh, individuals that had, um, uh, than the other babies who did not have um, um, <laughs> Uh, such a low, such sensitivity to methicoline. So it's quite interesting. You know, again, this could have, it was a month of age. Is it possible that this could have been influenced by the environment already and this airway hyperresponsiveness in these little babies uh, was already, um, uh, had already been uh, influenced so that they already had developed airway hyperresponsiveness? Or is this something that's really intrinsic to their lungs? I don't think the answer to that is, uh, is really clear. Um, uh, so, uh, in this paper, uh, which was, I think, I think also from the same group in Copenhagen, uh, they did early uh, uh, analysis of, or they did analysis of um, uh, different uh, respiratory pathogens to see if there was a single pathogen that might explain the development of asthma, as has been uh, noted, uh, RSV and also um, uh, rhinovirus C. Uh, have been noted to be particularly bad players and very, uh, uh, you know, and, and there's a lot of associations with the development of, of asthma. They looked at a number of different viruses and also pathogenic bacteria. Um, and for all the ones that they looked at in these, in these patients who were having, who were getting uh, um, samples of their uh, nasal, uh, nasopharynx taken during, um, during uh, exacerbations, during lower respiratory tract infections, um, all of them were, uh, were turned out to be significant uh, predictors for the later development of asthma. But if you looked for, if you tried to see if it was a specific agent, uh, all of those uh, significant uh, 
numbers go away. Um, so it turns out from this study, it looks like all of these agents are, are associated with uh, the development of asthma as though the host, it's really the host is uh, not handling any of these re, uh, infections very well if the host is destined to eventually go on to develop asthma by seven years of age. So uh, certainly some of them are, are, are worse than others uh, for sure, uh, but it looks like asthmatics uh, as a group have higher susceptibility to um, uh, lower respiratory infections by, by viruses. And it, and it could all, all go back to, the, um, to the, the little cartoons I was showing earlier where the airway uh, responses have been, have, been, uh, um, have been biased in a Th2 direction uh, and Th2 immune responses don't handle uh, viral uh, infections very well. Um, in this study, uh, which was from, uh, I think, Perth uh, in Australia. Um, they, uh, they did also uh, a, a, a survey of um, uh, nasopharynx, nasopharynx in their in patients at 2, 6, and 12 months of age. Um, and these naso, nasopharyngeal aspirates were also collected um, from the onset of, an, of, a, uh, of a, uh, a febrile um, uh, uh, um, uh, upper respiratory infection. And so um, any febrile, uh, the, the, the results of the study uh, show that pretty much in, uh, in all the children uh, and atopics, uh, any febrile lower respiratory um, infection was a predictor for wheezing at, at five years of age. Um, and um, uh, rhinovirus C, uh, which is, has been noted to be a particularly bad player, was particularly bad in the um, asthmatics as far as predicting wheezing. Um, also, early colonization with streptococcus turned out to be a, uh, a risk factor for the, develop, for the development of early wheezing. Persistent wheezing, um, actually, uh, statistically, rhinovirus C was the one that seemed to be uh, in all children as well as the atopics, uh, turned out to be uh, highly associated with that um, uh, with the development of persistent wheezing by, by 10 years of age. So uh, <clears throat> it looks like at least for the sh in the short term for uh, the development of airway hyperreactivity and wheezing and maybe even development of long-term uh, 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 asthma with some um, pathogens, uh, infection is, de is a definite player. So um, the next question we could ask is once, once you've developed this uh, Th2 or T2 biased airway immune response, uh, what is this going to do to impair host responses to pathogens? And this, uh, this little cartoon, which is also recently, um, is basically just illustrating that the continued exposure to viruses and allergens impairs uh, epithelial um, integrity so that these um, and also stimulates these um, Th2 mediators and those actually oppose the, um, the production of type 1 interferons which are, are uh, important in viral immunity um, and they also oppose um, antigen, viral antigen pre uh, presentation uh, by, den by uh, pulmonary den dendritic cells. Um, so uh, and this is basically just another way of saying I think that that uh, Th2 immunity uh, is, uh, uh, is not very good um, at helping to protect the host from, uh, from viral infections. It actually, um, uh, it actually opposes a lot of the, a lot of the um, um, immune responses that are, that are important in helping to protect uh, in, 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 in helping to protect the host from those types of infections. So in summary, in this, this section, um, host genetics, um, and also a combination of early microbial and uh, allergenic environmental influences appear to imprint a Th2 immune response in the lung in patients with asthma. And this, uh, these uh, immune responses are inefficient in providing defense against viral and bacterial infections. So, um, you know, the, uh, the issue is um, there are organisms like the one we're going to be discussing in a, in a minute um, that are subtle pathogens that, that make their living by living in, um, uh, by uh, uh, colonizing the host, sometimes causing trouble, sometimes not, 
Uh, but a, a, a host whose immune response is weakened is more likely to be colonized by those organisms and more likely to have trouble, um, and also to have trouble with uh, significant um, acute infections as well. And that's what's seen in patients with asthma, as anybody who's uh, observing what's going on in the schools right now um, with asthma and goes on uh, every fall uh, when they're exposed to a new, a new uh, when there's a new uh, epidemic of viral infections in the early fall at school, something we go through every, every year. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about um, atypical infection in asthma from uh, several different aspects. Um, I'm going to focus on mycoplasma pneumoniae. Atypical pneumonias were first, um, be and, or, were first began to be recognized <clears throat> back in the 30s and 40s. And this was a type of pneumonia in which it was the, uh, the onset was rather gradual. The, um, uh, the, the severity was frequently not, not too bad, um, although there were plenty of deaths, especially back then, uh, from uh, atypical pneumonias. Uh, and uh, the, the, the uh, radiographic appearance appeared to be more patchy, um, not the dense consolidation, low bar consolidation that you would see with uh, uh, pneumococcus, for example. <clears throat> so that's uh, the atypical. And so we, we typically refer to those uh, organisms now as atypicals. <clears throat> Sorry, there's nothing terribly atypical about them, but I mean, they're <clears throat> the organisms such as mycoplasma pneumoniae, um, chlamydia pneumonia, which is a, a type of chlamydia, um, chlamydia cetacea, which is the type of chlamydia that's carried in cytosine birds, uh, and also sometimes in, uh, in other birds, like chickens, apparently. It was just an epidemic in uh, some chicken uh, facilities, I think, in, in, uh, in the south here, <coughs> uh, that causes psittacosis. And then, of course, Legionella pneumophila uh, that causes Legionnaires disease are the four main types of organisms that ha can have this this kind of uh, slow, progressive presentation. <clears throat> I wanted to back up for a second and talk just a little bit about the organism, because most people know my mycoplasma very well, but they don't really realize uh, that they're part of an enormous group, possibly the largest and most diverse group of, 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 of bacteria um, that are out there, because these organisms are specialized parasites. And if you think about it, um, you know, if you parasitize, if you have a different species for every different species of mammal, uh, reptiles, fish, invertebrates, uh, and so forth, you're talking about an enormously diverse group. Quite interesting. Um, you can think of them as sort of like uh, ticks and uh, fleas on, on larger animals. This is a, uh, an electron micrograph of spermatozoa with um, a, uh, uh, a urea plasma infection, and you can see the little bacteria all nestled up on the spermatozoa here um, in, this, uh, in this kind of uh, creepy <laughs> um, electron micrograph. Uh, but they do adhere to cell membranes, and, or many of them do, and, um, and so they're difficult to, uh, to wash out. They may not come out in bronchoalveolar lavage fluid very well, um, unless there's a heavy infection, for example. Um, <clears throat> so um, there are uh, a uh, a number of different groups. Um, there are a group called phytoplasmas that cause plant uh, diseases. They're virtually unculturable right now. They're spread by insects like this leafhopper here. Uh, the poinsettia is a, is a plant that's actually got a phytoplasma infection that causes those showy uh, 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 distorted uh, flower-like uh, um, uh, inflorescences that they have. Then there's a huge group uh, called spiroplasmas that are, that are uh, prevalent in lots of arthropods, uh, a whole different variety of arthropods and some vertebrates. <clears throat> um, and um, it's been recently realized that there are mycoplasma-related endosymbionts that are colonizing the fungi that colonize the root systems of over 90% of vascular plants. So this is an extremely widespread group of bacteria over this terrestrial surface of the earth, um, and we know virtually nothing about what they're doing in there, whether they're, whether they're impairing uh, the growth of the plant, of the host plant, or, 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 or what. Um, finally, in an even more <coughs> uh, uh, little understood, I guess we could say, um, uh, uh, evolving um, area, it's turning out that most, or at least many, different groups of uh, uh, marine invertebrates are colonized with mycoplasmas. They have their own species um, 
corals, mollusks, cephalopods, echinoderms, um, and uh, what they're doing there and um, uh, is just a fascinating question um, and, and just adds to the, to the interest uh, that, uh, the, that these uh, uh, interesting uh, organisms um, uh, present. Um, this is a little tree basically showing um, where these organisms come from. They're thought to be derived from gram-positives, um, uh, gram-positive probably clostridia, um, and uh, this is, there are a whole different uh, group of, uh, of clades of these different uh, organisms as I indicated previously. <clears throat> in uh, humans, there are about 16 species that, that are, are, can be found in humans and only about five of them are, are frequently pathogenic, of which we're going to be talking about the one that causes respiratory infections. The other ones typically cause uh, subacute or even chronic infection. Uh, there's no, uh, some of them are, are commonly found in the oropharynx, uh, like Bucali here. There's another one called orale. Uh, there's one called salivarium that sometimes can cause invasive infections in immunosuppressed patients. We just published a case of one that uh, caused a multifocal septic arthritis in a CBID patient. Um, so they're, um, they can be bad actors. A lot of times they're apparently just colonizing the urinary tract as uh, urea plasmas and, and mycoplasma hominis frequently do, apparently without causing any problems, but they can cause serious problems. Um, and uh, of course, mycoplasma pneumonia is, uh, is sort of the flagship um, disease for causing a, uh, an acute uh, or subacute uh, atypical pneumonia, but uh, there's a suspicion that there's more to it than that, and that some patients may have a chronic uh, colonization, if you will, or, or chronic infection with this organism that's contributing to their uh, airway issues. <clears throat> I already mentioned the uh, atypical pneumonias and the organisms that have been associated with them most commonly. So mycoplasma pneumonia it's a facultative intracellular pathogen, apparently. There's, there's, there's several very good uh, papers suggesting that it can move into the interior cells. Some other bacteria, of course, can do that also that you wouldn't necessarily expect, like E. coli. Um, it causes up to 30% of community-acquired pneumonias. Uh, it's the most common cause of hospitalization for community-acquired pneumonia in, uh, in uh, older children. Um, it has a tiny genome. Um, with only 677 open reading frames, and this is the result of what's called reductive evolution. If you're a parasite, an obligate parasite, you don't need to know how to make all 20 amino acids. You don't need to know how to make a lot of the lipids, nucleic acids, and all that stuff. They've kicked all that stuff out, and yet we still don't know the function of over 20% of the genes that are there. They're probably related to pathogenesis. Um, it typically infects the ciliated epithelial cells in the lungs and produces a tracheal bronchitis, bad cough that can last for weeks. Um, it exhibits adherence and gliding mobility uh, through a specialized tip structure. <clears throat> and um, the organisms are really tiny. Uh, originally, it was thought to be a virus because it could be filtered uh, down to levels that nobody thought that the bacteria could go through, down to as little as 0.1 microns. Um, they don't have a cell wall, they don't make endotoxin, and their plasma membrane contains cholesterol. So they're quite atypical in that way from, from, the, from the bulk of bacteria. This is a, a photograph, an electron micrograph um, from a, a, a mycoplasma researcher. <clears throat> and uh, they have this fusiform appearance uh, uh, with an adherence, uh, uh, an adherence organelle at the uh, front end that they crawl around on surfaces with. And if this video works, I can show you the kind of creepy picture of these little guys crawling around in time-lapse photography on, uh, on a glass slide. Um, they're quite mobile, and so they can crawl around and move uh, through the respiratory epithelium, <clears throat> which is probably um, how they spread through that throughout the body. They have an interesting um, uh, substructure, subcellular structure, uh, that includes this uh, uh, very interesting um, uh, attachment organelle with uh, adhesive proteins studying the tip of it. Um, it's, uh, it's got a lot of um, <clears throat> uh, it's got a lot of proteins in it that uh, we're still trying to figure out what what they all do. But it helps to form a shape, this fusiform shape, and it also has a um, uh, uh, it also has almost a little cytoskeleton uh, within the 
within the cell that uh, helps it maintain its shape as well. <clears throat> so the questions I'm going to I'm going to talk about uh, initially is um, its a role, possible role in asthma pathogenesis, um, and then the questions are <clears throat> a role in chronic asthma or um, in uh, exacerbations of asthma. Um, sort of a, a, a somewhat different questions. <clears throat> Um, this paper was published um, several years ago from Taiwan, maybe the most powerful um, statistical analysis of a role for mycoplasma pneumonia uh, infection and the development of asthma. And this, in, this, um, in this study, I think they used um, 1,500 um, patients who had been diagnosed with mycoplasma pneumonia and then 6,000 um, controls, and uh, they were matched for sex and age. Um, and there appears to be a significant uh, increase in both uh, the group that had no com comorbidity and the group that had comorbidities um, for the development of subsequent asthma um, from, these, from this study, which was based on, uh, uh, on uh, diagnosis codes, basically, from from, uh, from the, uh, the database there. But um, this looks very much like there is a, um, there is a, that mycoplasma pneumonia infection is a risk factor for the development of subsequent asthma. Um, again, one could say, well, maybe they got the bad infection that, that caused them to get this diagnosis because they had asthma. And it's, that's, that's the conundrum that's hard to, hard to, um, uh, hard to argue with. But, um, it certainly does argue that um, that uh, that there's a relationship here, and that that patients with asthma do have a tendency to have had problems with mycoplasma in the past. Um, there was a, one of the best studies. Um, if you wanted to ask the question about whether or not uh, there was a a higher prevalence of the organism in patients with asthma, which you would think, if that if what we've been talking about is true, um, and there's a there's a decreased um, uh, uh, resistance, let's say, host resistance to colonization uh, with the organism, then you'd expect to find more mycoplasma pneumonia in patients with chronic asthma. And one of the best studies uh, that, that, that suggested that that might be the case uh, was done by Richard Martin and his group um, in, uh, at the University of Colorado, uh, in which they studied 55 chronic adult asthmatics. Um, I mentioned that um, uh, you know that you often don't find the material uh, that are you, you're not able to to find DNA from the organism in bronchoalveolar lavage fluid because it is adherent to the epithelium, but you can find it sometimes in biopsies um, and brushings. Um, and they did find um, uh, about 45 percent of those individuals that they studied um, had detectable mycoplasma pneumonia in their airway, um, mostly from brushings and, and biopsies. Um, and um, subsequent study by Monica Kraft, uh, who's also part of that group at that time, um, showed that treatment with macrolide for six weeks in a follow-up study, uh, they got a significant, F, uh, uh, they developed a significant improvement in their FEV1, but only in those subjects that uh, were PCR positive. And nobody had, none, nobody in this group had antibody. We're talking about kind of a low-grade colonization that's not stimulating um, much in the way of, a, of an antibody response. Um, a subsequent study in 2010, they attempted to, to validate this finding by repeating it. They couldn't uh, get enough positive patients uh, in this study uh, for some reason. Now, the patients were all treated with, uh, with high doses of uh, inhaled steroids, and they speculate maybe that was why, but for whatever reason, in this cohort, they only got 12 of 92, but that's still a lot. That's 13% that were, that were, that were, that were in which they had detectable. Um, and they didn't have the power in this study to show that the macrolide, uh, macrolide treatment did anything. Again, nobody had any antibody, though, so it did in some ways replicate. And there was one interesting um, finding in this paper, which is that even though the power wasn't there, um, there was a really interesting trend tendency for patients um, who... Uh, were PCR positive to have improvement in their ACQ st scores compared to uh, compared to the controls. So um, 
uh, and with the treatment with clarithromycin. So again, suggesting there could be a role here um, for uh, mycoplasma pneumonia in some patients with chronic asthma. But the data are really all over the place. I'm not going to go through all of these studies, but um, it's really difficult to uh, to demonstrate this. It's, it's quite dependent on the methodology that you're using, which has been all over the place. Um, uh, some people find a lot. In this case, uh, one group which is using a sort of ultra-sensitive um, toxin, uh, ELISA, as well as PCR, found that 65% uh, of the asthmatics were were positive, but also a substantial number of the controls. So uh, you can't really come to any conclusions. It does seem clear, though, that a significant proportion of chronic stable asthmatics have mycoplasma pneumonia in their airways. Uh, whether or not it's actually doing anything is, is the big question, I guess. <clears throat> um, so the next question is, is mycoplasma pneumonia a risk factor for asthma exacerbation? And again, those studies are all over the place. There are lots of small series um, demonstrating yes or no. Um, in this study, um, um, a French group uh, did a very nice two-year study uh, looking at children and adults uh, for the presence uh, of mycoplasma pneumonia, chlamydia pneumonia, or viruses uh, in the airways. Um, I think they were using, let's see, I can't remember the, the technique, whether it was, uh, uh, I think it was uh, nasopharyngeal rinses. But at any rate, um, in, in the interesting thing was that in, they only got, they didn't find any significant um, increase in the uh, children or adults with, um, uh, uh, with exacerbations. But the interesting thing was that with both chlamydia pneumonia and with um, mycoplasma pneumonia, they got higher numbers, although they weren't statistically significant, in the chronic patients rather than the acute patients. Um, uh, on the other hand, viruses, as you would expect, the exact opposite and highly significant. Um, these patients with acute exacerbations of their asthma, uh, whether they were children, um, uh, well, the children and the, all the group as a whole, and there was a trend in, in the adults, tended to have flares of their asthma caused by, caused by viruses, as we would expect. Um, so again, the data is not clear. Um, there may be some patients who are colonized uh, who are having flares. There's maybe some patients who are not colonized or are getting acutely infected and having flares. But uh, they're not a. It's not a. It's not something that's so frequent that you're going to be able to pick it apart with this kind of study. Uh, there is some interesting data. If you would think that <clears throat> mycoplasma pneumonia is involved in causing. Um, uh, acute exacerbations of asthma or wheezing, in this case, uh, we're looking at wheezing. Um, uh, Lynn Bacarrier and, uh, and colleagues looked at, um, and this is a recent review, um, where they're looking at the effects of azithromycin in patients with recurrent wheezing, and they found a, a significant uh, difference in, um, uh, in the treatment versus placebo. Um, there was a, a significant reduction in the, uh, in the risk of progression to severe episode in this fairly large study. Um, and uh, in a subsequent study that was done in, in Denmark, um, they also found that, uh, that azithromycin had a very beneficial effect, in this case, in the subsequent uh, episode duration uh, in patients with, um, uh, who were treated with azithromycin. Now, of course, our pulmonology friends uh, uh, frequently tell me that Azithromycin has anti-inflammatory effects, which is true. So um, again, you could say, well, maybe this is uh, non-specific. Uh, is there's nothing that actually proves that it's a, that it's the uh, actual antibiotic effect that's doing this. But it, uh, it's certainly an interesting observation. Um, and um, and again, you'd like to see uh, some further work trying to figure out the mechanism. Well, I'm going to spend the last few minutes talking a little bit about the organism itself and infections and diagnosis and treatment and that kind of thing, kind of, kind of uh, for patients with uh, asthma when your asthmatic patients do come in with a, an acute infection. Um, uh, the, the diagnosis and treatment is, uh, seems like it would be simple, but it's not necessarily quite so simple. Um, it's a very common infection, um, probably 2 million uh, infections in, in the U.S. per year.
it occurs in these epidemics that are probably due to waning host immunity, kind of what we're seeing right now, at least around here with the virus, the uh, viruses. We just we're having the most amazing e uh, epidemic of RSV and, and para influenza virus this summer, which never happens, probably due to the fact that everybody's been sheltering at home, and no, and many of the young children do not have uh, the normal uh, immunity that they've developed through constant exposure in school and daycare and so forth. Uh, to those viruses. Um, at any rate, um, the infection rate is similar, but pneumonias tend to be more common in older children, adults, and young, and young adults. Um, uh, and um, uh, it's got a long incubation period, typically two to three weeks. kind of depends on the intensity of exposure, of course. Uh, it does require close contact or droplets. Um, they saw this in the military when the people who developed infection with those that were closest to the showers where the humidity was high and so forth so um, it's uh, it, it's definitely more it tends to be more of a droplet spread disorder uh, one thing about it which I can't remember whether I mentioned this is that only one in 30 infections probably develops uh, a, a community acquired pneumonia or atypical pneumonia the other ones are are, uh, a, are uh, can be ranged from uh, a URI symptoms to asymptomatic to a tracheal bronchitis, which is the most common presentation. I think I do say that here, something like that. Um, yeah, so long, uh, this is basically repeating a lot of the, a lot of what I just talked about. Um, cough, a really persistent, annoying cough, sometimes wheezing, pleuritic chest pain um, are things that you can see. Um, then uh, radiographic findings, uh, it may look worse than what you would have thought if you you know, you may see fluffy infiltrates here and there that don't really, wouldn't really be predicted by your physical exam or the patient's uh, complaints. Um, and uh, there may be a bronchopneumonia present with, uh, sometimes with lobar consol consolidation, but usually sort of diffuse reticular nodular or interstitial infiltrates. Um, they may be unilateral, they're frequently bilateral, uh, lots of atelectasis, uh, pleural effusions are fairly common. Um, and uh, you can see this ground glass opacification with central lobular nodules and patchy consolidation with air bronchograms in pretty severe cases. So it can range, quite a range. Um, there are a number of virulence factors that are still being, uh, still being worked on to try to understand them. Um, I mentioned that this adhesive tip that the organism has is studded with these adhesins, uh, P1, which is the main uh, protein that's present there, is certainly required if you knock it out, uh, the organism is avirulent. Uh, it also produces lots of hydrogen peroxide and um, in some cases actually can, can uh, cause a hemolytic anemia. Um, it, uh, it produces lipopeptides that can activate the toll-like receptor system, particularly TLR2 and TLR4. And, um, it produces, uh, we have known since uh, 2006, that it produces a toxin that's homologous to pertussis toxin. It's an ADP ribosylating toxin. We're still trying to figure out what this toxin uh, does, actually. Um, uh, it does have this N-terminal ADP ribosyl transferase activity um, that uh, modifies uh, cellular targets. And one of those targets, uh, interestingly enough, is NLRP3. Uh, which is part of the NLRP3 inflammasome, so it may modify, activate uh, that, that inflammatory process or maybe otherwise modify it. Um, uh, it also, on its C-terminal, has a couple of activities. It will bind to uh, surfactant protein A uh, through this activity. That was how the toxin was first identified <clears throat> because the group was looking for SPA binding proteins. And it has a C-terminal vacuolating activity after this, if you, um, produce a truncated protein that, uh, that lacks this uh, C-terminal, it no longer causes the vacuolation in the, in the infected uh, cells in vitro. So uh, there, there are, and there's no clue as to the mechanism for how that particular uh, uh, toxin uh, effect is occurring. So lots of work to still be done to understand how this works. So um, regarding diagnosis, a lot of people will say, oh, you just get an IgM, but that's not necessarily very helpful. We've had a number of patients, I'm actually following a couple right now who've had recurrent mucositis associated with mycoplasma pneumonia, who have persistently positive IgM for years. So uh, this kind of also uh, speaks to the question that some patients may have a chronic infection with it. 
And then some asthmatics, um, uh, at least in our study, um, asthmatics didn't tend to make IG, IgG very well at all either. So um, you would think that you could that you could detect it. Still, acute and chronic, um, acute and convalescent titers are helpful, but those aren't helpful acutely when you need to treat the patient. An IgM, a negative IgM, uh, may be helpful, but some patients uh, may not make that antibody for a few days uh, in detectable amounts. So serology is is uh, useful. But, uh, but to rely on diagnosis uh, with serology alone, it's, uh, it's maybe not the most, not the most uh, helpful. Culture is certainly not uh, the best for diagnostic purposes, although it's really important if you want to find out um, what's going on in terms of antibiotic sensitivity. Culture is really essential, so cultures need to be done whenever possible, but they do take a long time. This organism has a slow turnover rate, um, and it... Um, uh, it can sometimes take six weeks for cultures to turn positive. Uh, it's also relatively insensitive compared to PCR, of course. PCR, kind of the ultimate sensitive uh, uh, diagnostic technique, is really the best way uh, in any kind of respiratory sample, sputum, uh, BAL fluid, well, we just talked about that, but throat swabs, uh, nasopharyngeal swabs, uh, throat washings, uh, those types of things. Uh, would be very appropriate, not blood, for example, um, typically. Um, and um, you can identify antibiotic resistance to macrolides and, and other things um, with some work through the uh, uh, using genomics, because we do know a lot about how that works. Um, here's the culture. This is what the uh, little colonies look like. You have to look at these under a microscope. They're so small. They're really teeny. Um, and uh, they have this kind of fried egg appearance that doesn't show up very well there. PCR, it's great, but it does have disadvantages. <clears throat> I mean, it, its advantages are you can get it back quick. Uh, it's often positive before the serology will be, um, and uh, you can do it on asymptomatic people. It's like super sensitive, but that's part of the problem, of course, is it's sensitive to contamination, um, and uh, you can't really do traditional antibiotic susceptibility testing. You can't find um, novel or new antibiotic resistance uh, genes and mutations using this technique very well. You'd have to do, uh, you'd have to do prove that the organism was uh, resistant to a certain or, uh, antibiotic and then try to and then try to pick that apart, which is what uh, microbiology labs and arts excel at doing. Um, I mentioned uh, that, that there's uh, macrolide resistance uh, coming up in mycoplasma pneumoniae. It's a, it's a big problem, particularly in Asia, uh, where it's become very widespread. Uh, it's all due to uh, mutations in the 23S ribosomal RNA gene, <clears throat> which is where the macrolides operate. Um, and um, it can occur, actually, while you've got the patient on therapy. Um, so that's been seen and published in a number of cases. Um, so the, the macrolides are not bactericidal, and um, so during the treatment, the organism may survive enough to be able to develop resistance to the antibiotic that you're trying to treat it with. Um, and uh, because of this, and because macrolides are really the only drug that we tend to treat children with for this infection, um, like uh, uh, other uh, types of childhood infections, children may constitute an untreatable reservoir of infection uh, for older children and adults um, who we tend to be able to use other, other types of medications for. Um, this is a real-time PCR, uh, uh, a picture of the plot. Uh, what's done is you do a PCR for the 23S, um, for a piece of the 23S ribosomal RNA gene, and because of the mutations, those um, double-stranded DNA pieces in the, in the PCR product melt at a different temperature. So you can do this melting point analysis and very clearly demonstrate uh, that the patient has a, a mutation in this gene. This is the, the melting point for the most common uh, macrolide-resistant um, mutation. It, it's found in oh, more than 90% of patients with macrolide resistance. Um, so it can be done very easily. Uh, we do that in the mycoplasma lab here at UAB all the time. Um, so I mentioned it was increasing uh, in prevalence. 
uh, and 90% in 2010 in Shanghai, 97% in Beijing. Those numbers have waned a little bit recently, but um, but uh, they're they seem to be getting worse in the western in western countries. Um, <clears throat> 26% in Italy was documented in this paper, 9% um, in France, 13% in, 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 in the U.S. in this earlier study in 2015. But in our most recent study in 2019, uh, it's over 20% here in the southeastern U.S. Uh, and there's this interesting difference uh, across the country. And interestingly, it, it also correlates with prescriptions for macrolides um, at outpatient care facilities. Um, uh, which you can quantitate, there, there's a tendency for, uh, if you go with a cough and URI symptoms to a, 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 an acute care uh, outpatient uh, facility uh, in this end of the country, you're more likely to get an antibiotic, uh, including a macrolide, than you are over here. And so it makes you wonder whether or not uh, that's really driving this increase. But at any rate, here in Alabama, uh, there's over a 20% chance that if you have a mycoplasma pneumonia infection, you've got a, a resistant strain. Does it correlate uh, with clinical uh, with the with the clinical course? And the answer is it's hard to study, <laughs> but yes, I mean the disease is frequently relatively mild and self-limited. So given that, but there are transplant patients, cancer patients, immunodeficient patients patients with co-infections with other organisms like COVID-19, for example, who, if they also have mycoplasma pneumonia, may not do so well as they might or might have ordinarily. Um, and uh, there are studies from, and this one is from Asia, where there's such a big problem right now with macrolide resistance, and they were able to demonstrate that there was longer period of fever, longer length of hospital stay, um, uh, uh, and uh, also an increased uh, proportion of the patients that were changed to another antibiotic because they were not getting better. So yeah, it does seem to affect, may not make a difference in a, in a normal patient, but uh, if your patient is very sick, it could make a big difference. So something to, something to think about. Um, these, uh, <clears throat> uh, these three drugs, macrolides, tetracyclines, and fluoroquinolones are the, the mainstay of treatment. Uh, they're, they're generally sensitive. We don't tend to use tetracyclines and fluoroquinolones in young children, of course, and macrolides. Uh, we use those a lot, um, and uh, that's the problem um, uh, because uh, young children uh, uh, may be uh, immunocompromised. They may have other types of uh, uh, host, host defense defects, and um, so uh, this may not be sufficient to hold them, and it also can... Um, can have, uh, um, uh, you know, can have significant effects as far as spreading the organism to other uh, maybe more susceptible people as well. There are a couple of new antibiotics. Maybe you've, maybe you've heard, heard of these or used, uh, used them. They're both uh, approved for treatment of mycoplasma pneumonia infection, I believe, and uh, they're both kind of brand new, um, uh, pretty high tech. Uh, and so we don't have a lot of data on it, but neither of them are approved for young children yet. So um, I kind of answered the question here that I was going to ask. So, uh, yeah, macrolides. So um, these are the take-home points. Um, a lot of info here. hope it wasn't too esoteric. But uh, uh, mycoplasma pneumonia prevalence uh, may be increased among patients with asthma. We're still waiting for definitive studies. Uh, I think that, that it's clear that there are a substantial number of patients with asthma, and probably normals uh, as well, that have chronic infections with this organism, where you can find the organism uh, in the airways uh, with, when they have no symptoms and no antibody. Um, and that's the way these organisms, I'd say sort of parenthetically, that's the way mycoplasmas and these other types of organisms typically work. Mycoplasma pneumonia is really an outlier. They don't work like viruses where they come in hit you and then go away and spread throughout the population. They, they, they're made to come in under the radar, stay, and be uh, parasites because they can't survive on uh, chicken salad or, uh, you know, on uh, potato salad out there in the community. They have to live on the host, the specific host that they're made to live on. Um, <clears throat> uh, the best diagnostic technique is uh, PCR um, on respiratory secretions. 
Um, and then this issue with the macrolide resistance that I think I've kind of beat to death here, but uh, don't forget about it. If, uh, if your patient is really sick, uh, you may want to empirically treat with something a little more potent uh, to cover it and not just say, oh, I'll just throw some azithromycin at it and it'll be fine. Um, so that's about it. I've, uh, I think that's, uh, that's all I had to present. Does, uh, does anybody have any questions? See, I'm not seeing yeah. anything in the chat. Pretty overwhelming um, but of information. Maybe a little <laughs> more microbiology oriented than uh, than a lot of people are, are interested in. But. No, it, it was great. I um, I thought it was really interesting um, with the like virome too. All the viruses that are just hanging out in there too that we wouldn't normally think about. So um, yes, definitely very interesting. A lot to think about. Um, okay, in the chat, there. here's a question. It says, is there any data suggesting that secondhand smoke affects the lung virome? Oh, boy. I, I would have to say there probably is, but I don't, I'm not familiar with it. I'm not sure. But I would bet anything that secondhand smoke would probably alter everything in the lung. The, the microbiome, I'm, I'm sure there's data there, too, and I'm not, I'm not uh, I should be more up to date on it than I am. I'm, I apologize. But yeah, I would bet, you know, a lot of this viral, um, uh, the viral information is still evolving rapidly and fairly new. So, I um, mean, I didn't even cover the mycome, which is the fungal microbiome, uh, which there's also some very interesting uh, work going on in that area. Also, any kind of environmental influence probably is going gonna, is gonna, is gonna to have an effect. So, uh, and anything that suppresses immune responses in the lungs, I would expect to affect uh, the viral, the, the production of, and, uh, and long-term carriage of viruses. Uh, we certainly see it in primary immunodeficiency patients. So um, I would expect that there would be. A, it's a good, good study, it sounds like. We're just waiting for you, whoever <laughs> asked that question. <laughs> uh, there's another question that popped up here, too. It said, what would be um, other antibiotic options for pediatric population if we are concerned about macrolide resistance? since we cannot use fluoroquinolones and tetracyclines. Right. There, there is actually, you know, we're, we're really, a, we're really uh, have really been, had it drilled into us for years that uh, the tetracyclines uh, are to be avoided because they damage uh, the dental, uh, the, the, uh, the teeth, basically. They stain and, and, uh, and damage the, the developing secondary teeth. But actually, there are new papers that suggest that doxycycline uh, for at least, oh, I think it was 10 days, is safe. And doxys, there is no natural resistance to doxycycline or fluoroquinolones in, uh, in mycoplasma pneumonia. So if you can use either of those drugs, now tetracyclines are still not bactericidal, so fluoroquinolone is preferred. We do use those in young children, not very young children, but we do use them in young children occasionally, uh, particularly immunodeficient kids. I've used them quite a bit when we had to. Don't like, it's not something you're gonna jump to, but if you've got a sick patient, um, one of those two drugs would be probably the ones to, uh, to, to use. The other two, uh, the new ones, omatocycline and, uh, and uh, uh, lefamulin, those are uh, so new that we really don't have a lot of information in kids um, at all. So I don't think those would be probably good, good choices. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Atkinson. Um, looks like we're over time, so we don't want to keep you, um, but thank you again for uh, your presentation. We really appreciate you being part of COLA today. All right. Enjoyed it very much. Thanks, thanks for the invite. Thank you. Have a good one. Okay. Bye.